on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun And failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Yeah, failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun And failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does Yeah, failure won't define me Cause that's what my father does
on this journey to get lost in my mistakes what looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength and my story isn't over my story's just begun and failure won't define me cause that's what my father does yeah failure won't define me cause that's what my father does
scheduled for it. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's get ready to worship Him. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for all that you have done for us through Jesus Christ, Father. Lord, we ask now that tonight that you will allow us to worship you through song, through your word. Lord, we pray that you will encourage everyone that is with us, whether we're here together in this building or we're at home. But Lord God, we pray that you will be worshipped, you will be glorified. We pray that you will be glorified in the changing of our hearts and our minds. Lord, work tonight and work in us that we may glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Join us.
Okay, all you choir members out there watching with us, sing along with us now. So you know this one. so much. Let me check and make sure my mic is on, and it is. All right. That's good. That's one less thing that I haven't messed up today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do lift you up. That is our goal when we meet together, yes. whether we meet on person or whether we meet online. Our goal is to worship you and to lift you up and to say you are worthy. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we pray that the songs that we have that we have sang tonight, that Lord God, that it has been used to glorify you, and it has been a sweet sound in your ear. Yes. 
Lord, we pray now that your word will move within us, that it will bring encouragement, that it will bring rebuke, that it will bring not just information, but it will bring transformation. Lord, if there's anybody that does not know you tonight, we pray that you will save them tonight. And for those of us that do, that we'll be made more into the image of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning, we were in Revelation chapter 3, and we were talking about the church at Sardis that had fallen asleep spiritually. They were dead. They were dead spiritually. Not completely dead. The great thing is our God has the power to resurrect the dead. They were believers that had not lost their salvation because once Jesus Christ saves you and he's got a hold of you, you're not going anywhere. But they had lost their love. They had lost their passion. They had drifted away, ultimately. The church at Ephesus has lost their first love. The church at Pergamum had compromised. The church at Thyatira had gotten out of balance and had emphasized love and tolerance over holiness and righteousness. And the church at Sardis, they had, they had died. And Jesus Christ said to them, you have drifted away from me spiritually. It's time for you to wake up. And strengthen that that remains. Remember what I taught you, what you have learned. And today we're going to talk more about spiritual drift. Because honestly, I really believe that that is probably one of the biggest dangers that Christians today deal with. Because life is just designed, since sin into the world, to cause us to drift. I mean, you've got all the pressures of work and school and families, and, and, and cooking dinner, and cleaning up, and hauling off the trash, and cutting the grass, and you know all the things that have to be done at the house, helping the kids with homework. And it's so easy to just let the things of life pull you away. The currents and the eddies of life cause you to drift away from being close to Christ. So let's open up our Bibles as we talk about spiritual drift to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. For this reason, we must, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. First of all, we have to recognize that spiritual drift is sin, and it's because of sin. Spiritual drift is sin. It's the sin of not having the Lord and the things of the Lord as the spiritual, emotional center of our life. And it's easy to drift away. Work is so consuming. I know people that literally work seven days a week. And you're, and you're scared to say, no, I'm not, because guess what? There are 10 people that want your job. And even if you work just five days a week, most of the time Saturday is reserved for work around the house. You know, cutting the grass and weed eating or doing all the other things that you didn't have time for during the week. I mean, I know some people that they come home, they're so exhausted that, you know, they don't go get groceries. It's like they come home, they fix them something, and they just rest, and then they go to bed because they got to get ready again for the next day. And, you know, or it's for hobbies. And honestly, sometimes hobbies can cause that emotional drift because you get so tied up in those things that it just sort of gradually pulls you away from the Lord. Relationships take time. You know, one of the things I, I, I try to encourage people is Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Right. And every relationship has time. 
You know, how many men have you heard this? You haven't spent any time with me lately. Why? Because your wife is smart enough to recognize that relationships take time, and if you don't spend time together, you will eventually grow apart. Yeah. And you know, and, and, and honestly, I like I said, I've done marriage counseling for over 20 years. And honestly, that's what happens a lot of time. Husband and wife, they're just so busy working and raising the kids and getting the kids to football practice and cheerleading practice and gymnastics and basketball. They never see each other. And then guess what? The kids grow up and you've got two people that have been married for 35 years and they don't know each other. That's, there's so many things. School can pull you away, can cause you to drift away from the Lord. School is hard. I know. I, I'm going to tell you, you know, my sixth grade year was, was one of my favorite times in life. You know, it was so enjoyable that I spent three years there. Okay? But I did finally make it to seventh grade. But school is so demanding. You know, my son is a senior at North Greenville University, and, you know, he took a class this summer. And I would go in his room, and my son would not be in there playing video games or doing, you know, doing something. He would have his laptop out and a book studying. He studied all summer long. I mean, all the kid has done this summer is study and go to church. It's been crazy. The way the world is set up, it's designed to help us to very easily drift away from the Lord. The eddies and the currents. Like I said this morning, the world, our own flesh, the devil, all of those conspire to help us drift away. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 because we want to avoid spiritual drift. And to avoid spiritual drift, we must, for this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we will not drift away from it. Number one, Jesus said it in Revelation chapter 3. He's saying it here. Pay attention. Wake up. Folks, when we drift in our spiritual life, it's because we are not paying attention. Neglect. Folks, I'm going to be blunt with you. You are either growing in your spiritual life or you are drifting away. Now, I've said this before, and I'm going to tell you something. This is my, this, everything I have led has led me to believe this. Everything I have studied through the years. We talk about maintaining our spiritual walk. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't believe there is a maintaining in our spiritual realm. I believe you are either moving closer to the Lord or you're moving away. But just as like if I took a baseball and I threw it up in the air, if you were to watch it on camera, and be able to freeze it, you would see that there is a moment where the force that I have put behind it exactly equals the gravitational pull of the earth. And for a split second, that ball is holding steady. But then it starts dropping. Folks, that split second where it's holding steady is where you and I are if we're just holding our own spiritually. It means we're either getting ready to keep on going or we're getting ready to drop. And most of the time, it means we're getting ready to drop. Now, that period of time might be days, weeks, months, even a year. But I want to challenge you. Holding your own spiritually is not what it's about. God wants us to grow spiritually. But honestly, I believe that we mistake that, that maintaining as saying we're doing pretty good. And what we don't recognize is we're about to start drifting spiritually away from Him. I believe that you're either growing because you are paying spiritual attention or you're getting ready to drift because you're not paying spiritual attention. Here's something I want to challenge you with. No one grows spiritually by accident. I mean, you know, it's not like you're just walking down the road and all of a sudden, shazam, God zaps you and all of a sudden you have grown spiritually. Okay? You are reading the Word. 
You are praying about the word. You are pondering the word. But you are doing something that you are exercising your spiritual muscles. You're not just sitting around and like I say, shazam, you get zapped. And you have grown spiritually. You do not grow spiritually by accident. We drift spiritually by letting our eyes, by letting the eyes of our heart getting fixed on things that don't really matter or that are worldly or that are temporal things that are constantly crying out for our attention. Folks, a leaky toilet is important, okay? It has to be fixed. And if it's leaking and flooding your bathroom, it's got to be fixed. And I mean, see, there's all these things in the world like that that are constantly crying out for our attention. But if we're not careful, that's all we focus on. Well, the grass has got to be cut. I've got to put a new toilet in the guest bedroom because it's leaking. You know, I've got to get a new roof on the house. I've got to get the oil changed in the car. I've got to, you know, I've got to, you know, wax the cat, you know, and stuff like that. You know, all this crazy stuff that the, the world just gets you sucked in on. And yes, I did say wax the cat because I want to see how many of you were actually paying attention, okay? But we can get distracted. We can quit paying attention because we're paying attention on something else. Everybody is focused on something. The question is, what are you focused on? What are you focused on? We get distracted, we quit paying attention, and we eventually take our eyes off of Jesus. And then we even stop thinking about Jesus. We're warned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. You see, when we start thinking that we're doing good, that's when we've got to be extra careful. Because honestly, we can be like the walking dead. We are... We have died spiritually. We have drifted spiritually, but yet we're still doing the things. We're going to, to church. You know, we're working in the church. We're reading our Bible. We're praying half-heartedly. You, you know that that's kind of where you are. You know, you flip open your devotion. You know, you flip it open. Well, Jesus wept. Well, that's really bad. That's really wild. Think about that Jesus wept just like you. And okay, dear Lord, please just help me. God, help, help me to understand. Uh, amen. And then we just get on with our day. That's the way our Bible study becomes when we've drifted spiritually. It becomes a check mark on a list, like brushing your teeth or putting on your socks or, you know, do it, or putting on some kind of footwear because most people I see have something on their feet. You don't see a lot of people barefoot unless they're at the beach. The fact is, reading the Bible and praying can become just like getting dressed to go out. It's just something that becomes a habit that we do. And we do, you know, and, and ironically, we probably spend more time and energy and thought on getting dressed than on the things of God. I mean, I don't because I have a wife that dresses me because I'm kind of colorblind and she'll look at me and she'll go, don't wear that with that. And that is as wrinkled as a dog's bed. You are not wearing that to this iron. And I'm thankful for that. So I really don't put a lot of effort into what I think. I just thank the Lord that he gave me a wife that has fashion sense and color coordinated, you know. But the truth is, drifting from your faith is so dangerous because it's so subtle. You know, it's not like a thunderstorm. When the thunderstorm comes up, you don't have to go, hmm, I wonder if a thunderstorm's coming up. Boom, crash, boom, boom, boom. You know it's there. A thunderstorm is not subtle. But drifting from the faith is so subtle that you may not even realize that it's happening. Because drifting can happen so slowly over such a long period of time that you don't even realize you're drifting. Until we've drifted so far from where we were spiritually, and we may not even realize we're in trouble. Again, we're to pay attention. We are to look for signs of spiritual drifting. What are some signs of spiritual drifting? Well, number one, we begin to pull away from the Word of God. Okay? 
We don't really read his word. We, we don't really study his word because, folks, there's a difference between reading his word and studying his word. Because, see, that's part of our problem. A lot of us will read God's word, but we don't really study. What does it mean? How, what did it mean to them then? Because what the same principles that applied to them at that time apply to us today. When it says, husbands, love your wife, as Christ loved the church, that's not a principle that, that, that doesn't apply to us today. Absolutely applies to us today. But what does it mean to love your wife as Christ loved the church? You know, it's one thing to read. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Okay, you've read it. But what does it mean? How did Christ love the church? What does that imply? I'm a husband. So it's talking to me. What do I need to do then? There's a difference between reading the word and studying the word. But when you begin to drift spiritually, you don't really read the word much. And you definitely begin not studying the word. And I'm going to tell you something about the word. The word is one of the few things, it's the only thing I know about really, that the more you have, the more you want. You know, when I go, or went, I should say, it still leaves a hollow place in my heart that the western sizzling in Clemson is closed down. My life has never been the same, which either shows how what a wonderful place it was or what a pathetic person I am. Maybe both, but I love western sizzling in Clemson. But when I would go down, I would eat. And I would get their good old Texas toast. I'm not a yeast roll kind of guy. I mean, I'm a meat and potatoes and a Texas toast kind of guy. And when I ate it, I was full and I was satisfied. And I didn't want any more until the next time. But the word is totally different. The more you have, the hungrier you get for it. And the crazy thing is, the less you have, the more your appetite for it dies and goes. But you, you, you don't read the Word. You're not, you're not studying the Word. You know, you spend more time on Facebook than you do in his book. You know, you spend your time, you find your time is being spent on things of the world. You, that may not even be bad things. They may be good things. But we spend more time on the things of the world than we do letting him speak to us. God's got a word for us. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, God says this, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. And he gives us a warning. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. We're not to love the world. When you realize that you're in love with the things of the world, that's a sign that you've drifted spiritually. When you pull away from the things of God, another sign is when you pull away from the people of God. Because that's one of the reasons God has called us to gather together. That's one of the things that's been so difficult about this virus separation. And I'm hoping and praying that soon, very soon, that we're going to be able to, to gather here for all of our services. But I'm going to be honest with you. We've got to come together because that, that one another, and that's important because one of the ways that we drift spiritually is we separate ourselves from the people of God, people that might actually look at us and hold us accountable. You pull away from the people of God and you start hanging around with the people of the world and the things of the world. And we begin to lose our heart for others. We fall away from that close fellowship with other believers and we begin to neglect that accountability and the connection with those who will encourage us and will challenge us in our walk with Christ. You can tell that we're beginning to fall away. We're beginning to drift away when we lose our passion and our excitement for worship. 
And we recognize that our passion and excitement comes from the worship of things of the world. You know, it's always amazed me how people can remember things. But you know, I never looked to get there. There was one guy I went to church with. And buddy, he knew every college football stat that has ever existed. You could ask him, but when he was asked about the Word of God, he couldn't remember. Oh, I can't remember all that stuff. The Bible's complicated. Really? You can remember all this stuff, but you can't remember the Bible. Now, the guy that says, I can't remember nothing, is being honest. The man that can remember all of this, but nothing of the things of God, is not being honest with himself. What he's telling you, or she's telling you, is this matters. And I, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to probably step on some toes. You know, my wife loves Clemson football. My, my father-in-law went to Clemson. My wife went to Clemson. My daughter went to Clemson. But I'm going to be blunt with you. You can go to a Clemson football game and scream and yell and holler and be all excited, but then when you come together to worship the Lord, you're sitting out there like this. Come on. Come on. I love Clemson football, too. I hope they go all the way this year. I don't know what college football is going to look like this season. But at the end of the day, I'm excited. I hope they win. But at the end of the day, folks, I'm going to be blunt with you. I'm more concerned about the, the things of God and eternal life and things that will matter and last forever and ever than I am who wins a football game. And NASCAR, well, I'm going to be blunt with you. When Dale Earnhardt died, as far as I'm concerned, racing died. I haven't watched a single race since 2001. And all this car of the future junk, don't even get me started on that. But I'm just going to be blunt. We get so bent out, we get so caught up in the things of the world, but you find the things of God boring, and you have no passion for it. Those are some signs of spiritual drift. And when you, if you see that in your life, pay attention to it. Pay attention to it. Now, how are we going to fight it? Pay attention. Hebrews 2, verse 1. For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we will not drift away from it. Pay attention to the truth that you have heard. Remember what you've been taught. Remember what you've received. The way to prevent the sin of spiritual drifting is to realize that the Christian life needs constant consistent guarding attention and watching and we are to remember pay attention to the truth that we've received we're to be on guard against all these forces but we're also to pay attention to what we have learned from reliable theologically sound pastors and teachers from the Holy Spirit from the word what we've heard what have we heard that matters? That Jesus Christ came and he gave his life for sinners like all of us. That is amazing that there is the forgiveness of sin that is available through the blood of Jesus Christ, through saving faith. And that once we're saved, we're people on a mission to follow him. Not to follow the latest Star Wars movie, which there has not been one since Revenge of the Sith, because I do not consider the last ones to be anywhere near canon. That happened in an alternate universe where the characters were very, very awful, okay? And the plot was very, very awful. But, you know, people follow that. Where would we be as Christians if we followed Jesus Christ as thoroughly as some people follow sports or Star Wars Amen. or anything else yep. where would we be you know we need to remember what we've heard from theologically sound teachers from the word of God as God speaks to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit as we read his word folks I'm going to tell you something one of the most dangerous places to be for spiritual drift is to be is Christian television and Christian bookstore, because I'm telling you, a whole lot of the junk that they're putting out is junk. It is Some of it is just totally against the Word of God. Now, you know, you go in some place, 
that's nasty and worldly, you're kind of got your guard on. Ooh, I need to be careful. You walk into a, you, a Christian bookstore, you walk into, you turn on to a, a Christian network, you go, oh, this is okay. Folks, that's where you need to be the most on guard. You need to remember from those theologically sound teachers. Notice Hebrews 2. Verses 1 to 3. For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard. Why? So that we will not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect such so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed by those who heard. Think about this. The word was spoken through the Lord. The things that was heard. And it was so important. This is a rhetorical question. Think about this. In the Old Testament, God's message very often came through angels. In fact, Galatians chapter 3 verse 19 says, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. The Bible said, okay, if that revelation of God's truth, of God's standard, of God's righteousness through angels was unalterable, and every time we broke, we transgressed, we disobeyed, and we received a just penalty, if every sin was punished, even then, now surely when his new covenant has come, when the Son has come, and he has given his word, how can we escape punishment? If we reject such a great salvation that has now come through the Son. In other words, we need to pay attention and not take our salvation for granted, his word for granted, and to recognize that it is and should be the foundation of our life, right. the focus of our life. That we should stop saying, I'm an American at the, as the center of our life. I'm a man at the center of my life. I'm a South Carolinian at the center of my life. You know, it should be, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ before I am anything else. That should be the center of the foundation. We neglect, we lose focus, we drift when we stop paying attention to what Jesus did for us. That he paid our penalty, the one that we rightfully owed. That he died for our sin. This is the great salvation. Do we not think that there will be a consequence because we have drifted from that great salvation? Do you think God is not going to snap us into a wake-up call? And if we do not repent and return, that there is going to be a penalty for that? God's salvation isn't something you just tack on to your life. You know, i got to be honest with you. Um, I, you know, people, people, I like to watch people. I think they're interesting. They really are. And, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. I love talking to other people. But I, I never will forget you know, I was at a preacher convention one time. And I want to be honest with you. I recognize how difficult a true earned doctorate is. And I respect that. But I never will forget. There was a guy, and I called him Pastor So-and-so, and he very quickly, you will refer to me as doctor. <laughs> and me being the smarty-warty that I am, as I said, Really? Listen, my back's been hurting me just a little bit here. Could you take a look at that? I have no problem referring to a seminary professor as doctor. And I respect a pastor who has earned his doctorate. But can I tell you something? It tells you a lot about a man when you refer to him as pastor and he doesn't correct you. They put the word reverend before my name. 
I loved it when I was ordained. And my wife's first comment was, ain't nothing to be revered about you, son. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Bonnie. I really appreciate that. But you know something? Let me ask you this. How many times do I make y'all call me Reverend? How many times have I demanded that you call me pastor? So what I call you? Call me Sean. You gonna call me Pastor Sean? I'm good with that. You gonna call me Preacher Sean? I'm good with that because I do preach. But I'll be honest with you, I'm just me. I don't Amen. get bent out of shape because of titles. Amen. I respect them. Like I say, I respect them. Earn PhD, although I do have a PhD myself, a pick and tie diploma, but that's another <laughs> subject for another time. But the truth is, God's salvation isn't something like a title that you add to your life to round you your life out. God's salvation isn't like a PhD or an MDiv or a whatever you add on to your name. God's salvation is the very core. It's the center of who you are. Your salvation should be the focus on your life. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. But if you say, Sean, who are you? I am a child of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, right. And I didn't deserve it. That's the amazing thing is I deserve to go and die and go to hell. Mm. And I know it. Mm. But he loved me so much that he died while even I was a sinner. He loved me. That's the great salvation that we neglect, that we drift away from that fact. Salvation is great because it comes to us through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. That's why it's such a great salvation. It wasn't just spoken through, about through angels. It was spoken through the Lord. It was confirmed by those that heard it. And it was confirmed by signs and wonders when the dead rose and walked among us and then ascended into heaven. Salvation is great because it comes to us through Jesus Christ. Salvation is true. Look at Hebrews 2, 4. God also testifying with them those that saw it, that heard it, by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by through today, by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. I got to be honest with you. When I told Bonnie that I felt like God was calling me to become a pastor, she first thought I was joking, and she laughed her head off. But when I told her that I was serious, she stopped. And she said, you know what? I, I can see that, actually. I can see that. I'm a pastor only through the work of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing pastorally in my nature, you know? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the opposite by nature of what a pastor is supposed to be. And it's a constant fight against my own flesh. Because, you know... I'll be honest, I'm kind of a smart aleck. You know, I, I don't suffer fools gladly. You know, I have a tendency to rush in and say something really, really dumb when I could think about it and study on it and say something that actually made sense, you know. But God has is molding me and changing me. And, you know, my, I, I really my goal is I want to be more of a man of God and more of a godly pastor tomorrow than I am today. And I want to, want to be more today than I was yesterday. I want to grow. I want to be more. And all of us have got one spiritual gift or another if we're truly born again. 
And the fact that God is doing such amazing things. Not only did he do signs and wonders then, but he is doing signs and wonders today in us and through us, through his own spirit. How can we drift away by, by just not paying attention to his word? That is the warning to the people at Sardis that he gave 2,000 years ago, and it's the warning that he gives us today. Watch your spiritual core. Watch your salvation. Wake up and recognize how precious it is, how wonderful it is, that it should be the core of your life, that that should be how you identify yourself as I am a child of God not by anything I've done but because of what Jesus Christ on an old rugged cross 2,000 years ago did for me such a great salvation we've got to pay attention to our spiritual life let me ask you this how many of you just go out and take your debit card out and just run it or write checks or pull money out of your pocket without thinking about it at all. Nobody that I hang around with, honestly, okay? And the reason we don't is because most of us do not have an unlimited supply of money. Unless you're the federal government and can just print it for yourself or tax it out of us, okay? We don't have an unlimited supply of money. So we pay attention to it. We shop around. And you know, it's just crazy. It's crazy. You know, I use Mobile One synthetic oil in my truck. That's a good oil. Yeah. I've had good luck with it. But you know, when I usually what I try to do is get like the five quart container. It's amazing. There is one store that sells it. I had bought it for as cheap as $22.95 at one store, and I went to another one, and it was like, like $30, $36 for the same thing. And I'm like, y'all have lost your minds. I am going to wait and go back to the store that I can pay $22 for it. Not $36 is what I think it was at one store. One store is actually $41. And I'm just like, that's a good joke. Y'all lost your mind. I ain't paying that for that. I pay attention to it because I don't have an unlimited supply of money. Where would we be if we paid as close attention to our spiritual lives right. as we did our financial lives? Now, I'm going to make a confession to you, okay? I am not really an OCD kind of person, but I am when it comes to cutting grass. Okay, It drives me nuts to see these little rows of grass sticking up like a mohawk on your line, on your, on your, your yard because somebody didn't pay enough attention to whack that sucker down. Okay? You know? I pay attention when I cut grass. That's one of the things I love about Dwayne. I'm going to tell you something. When Dwayne cuts a yard, it looks like he got out there with a pair of scissors and cut every grass, grass by grass. I mean, it's perfect, man. It's perfect. I love it. Dwayne is the only person that can cut my grass and satisfy me. <laughs> okay, I'm being honest. I really am. What if we were that particular about our spiritual lives? What if we paid as much attention to how we are spiritually? Let me ask you this. What if we pursued spiritual life with purpose? What if we pursued our spiritual life with passion? What if we worked on building ourselves up spiritually? strengthening ourselves spiritually the way we do with, with our bodies. I never will forget, I had a PE coach, and I loved him. He was so funny. I said, what's your advice for life? He said, eat right, get plenty of exercise, and you're going to die anyway. I said, thanks a lot, coach. I said, that's really encouraging. He said, but it may be later than sooner if you do that. I said, okay. I said, I'll do what you're saying. We are to strengthen our bodies. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit if we're saved. We should take care of them. We should maintain them. But, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen somebody that works so hard to maintain themselves physically? What if we worked that hard to maintain ourselves spiritually? Do you see where I'm going with this? Purposely building ourselves spiritually. Because like I said, you're either growing or you're pulling away. There's no in-between. They may look like it, but I really don't think there is. So let me ask you some questions tonight. Do you need to build up your spiritual life? Okay, I got to be honest. That was a trick question. Okay? Kind of like the guy that they gave an award for being humble and then they took it away from him when he went up to accept it. You know? The answer is, there is nobody except Jesus Christ that ever walked the face of this earth that did not need to build up their spiritual life. No matter where you are, you have not arrived. And honestly, a lot of our problem is so many of us think that we have arrived spiritually. And we haven't realized that while if we compare ourselves to somebody way back there, we may have grown spiritually above them. But if we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, we haven't accomplished anything yet. We all need to build up our spiritual life. Let me ask you this. What are you doing to build up your spiritual life? What are you doing? Really? What are you doing to build up your spiritual life? Are you waiting for a pastor to do it for you? Because I'm going to be blunt with you. That's what a lot of people do. Well, I'm going to find me a church that meets my needs. Folks, church is about worshiping Him and serving Him, not about you and I getting our wants satisfied. What are you doing to build up your spiritual life? What are you seeking? Are you purposely seeking it? Are you in the Word? Is the Word becoming a part of you? Are you just reading the scriptures or are you studying the scriptures? Are you praying for wisdom and guidance? Do you long and want to be more than where, what you are? I'm going to be honest with you. I will never be satisfied until I'm like Jesus. And I'm also going to be honest with you. I got a real long way to go. And I know it. And it embarrasses me terribly. It embarrasses me terribly. The reason I stand up here on Sunday and Wednesday is not because I want to. I really don't because honestly, I'm embarrassed to stand up here. But I stand up here because God has called me to. And I'm going to obey Him. What are you doing to build up your spiritual life? What are you exercising spiritually to build your spiritual relationship with the Lord? How much time are you putting into it? How much effort are you putting into it? Spiritual growth doesn't just happen. You have to long for it. You have to be willing to do your part. Because if you'll do your part, God will definitely do his part. And yet, it really and truly, he empowers all of it. But he does not force himself on those that do not want him. And we're going to end with this spiritual truth. You and I have as much of the Lord as we want. We have as much of the Holy Spirit as we want. The point is, are you happy where you are spiritually? And if you are, I'm sorry for you. Or do you want more? Because if you are, ask. Seek and you will find. Admit that you're empty and you will be filled. The Lord is ready to do something special in each of us beyond just saving us. He is wanting to equip us to turn the world upside down. Can I give you all a hint? The world is already upside down. He wants us to be open to being used by him to shake it up the right way. But it takes being spiritually ready are you ready? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, 
we do want to be spiritually ready. Lord God, if we have drifted away spiritually, wake us up. Help us to pay attention. Help us to listen to the things that we've heard. Help us to remember that there is a consequence for drifting spiritually. But also, if we repent, if we ask for your forgiveness, confess that we're wrong and return, you will welcome us back and you will build us and guide us. Heavenly Father, work in us so that you can work through us. Lord, allow us to be your witnesses in this church, in our homes, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, to wherever you take us, Lord. Lord, use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, we are so thankful that you have been with us tonight. It is our prayer that God's word and God's spirit has worked in you tonight. Join us back this Wednesday night at uh, 6.30, and we will see you then. May God's blessing and peace be upon you. Take care. Good night.